one of our first speakers in our first year was actually in the field of quantum computing, and we had him speak in 2010, and he gave a talk. And I just thought it'd be fun to take a look back at that talk from a few years ago. In the quantum world, things are much more different. They are vague, fuzzy, and we're trying to understand what does that mean for our world. As we build quantum devices and go to larger and larger scale, suddenly this reality of the microscopic world will come in and creep in in ours, and we'll start to redefine reality the same way as probably Galileo redefined reality when he thought about the Earth turning around the sun instead of the other way around. Dr. Ray Laflamme, who is heads up the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. We've actually asked Ray to come back and join us on stage to give us a bit of an update of where things have gone since then. So please welcome Ray Laflamme. So, can you give us a quick, let's say, 30-second refresh on quantum mechanics and quantum computing? <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> the world in which we live most of the time is described by a set of rules, a set of laws that we've inherited from Galileo, from Newton, from Maxwell's. But as Alison mentioned, as we go to smaller and smaller scales, these rules break down. It's replaced by a new set of rules called quantum mechanics. And the idea of quantum computing is to use these rules to manipulate information. Why do you want to do this? Because certainly there are problems that are intractable with the old rules, which can be solved with the new rules. There are things we can do that we couldn't do before. And this is the idea of quantum computing. So can you give us an idea of what's happened since you were last on the TEDx Waterloo stage in the last three years, four years? So for the Institute, first thing is we have a new facility, absolutely gorgeous building, straight in the middle of the campus. Um, you might have heard last week, uh, Mike Lazaridis and Doug Friggins have a new venture, the Quantum uh, Investment Fund, to commercialize some of our ideas, which is quite surprising because I thought it would take 20 to 30 years before some of these things would hit the, the market. But it's happening right now. And in the science side, what is happening? <laughs> on the science side, the biggest uh, impact we've had is to be able to control atoms and molecules much more precisely. In fact, about a hundredfold more precisely in the last uh, three to four years. And this has had an interesting spin off that suddenly we can use the ideas that we have developed for quantum computing to think about other problems that quantum mechanics can solve. In fact, maybe what we've learned to do is to talk, interact, and listen to atoms and make them dance and do things that we want them to do. So to give you a very, idea, a very rough idea of what these quantum sensors are that we're trying to build, if we can talk to objects or to systems and they can talk back to us, we can do things much more efficiently. Example, if I ask in this room, how many people have green eyes and black hair? Then I can go around and count them and look at everybody, it will be hard. If I ask you, raise your hand if you have green eyes and black hair. One, so that was a lot easier than counting one by one. So that's what we do. We go and talk to atoms and molecules and tell them to do certain things. And we call this a quantum algorithm. I'll give you one example which was quite surprising that Five years ago, I would never think it would be possible to use what we do to this. This is a neutron interferometer. So Alison talked about the X bosons. We are a much larger scale in this. We use neutrons at the a center of, uh, new, of uh, particles, of uh, nucleus of atoms. The neutrons comes in, and then they are going to split in two. They get on a superposition on beyond the left and the right. They split in two, they hit the second blade, and come back and they interfere, and there's a detector at uh, their side. You can image things, like a little blue box that you see in the, in the video over there, by kind of moving slowly and looking at which detector clicks and not click. Now, why is this surprising? This looks pretty big. It's because the wavelength of neutron is about the size of an atom. So we can image things at the size of atom. So this thing has to not move on the scale of the size of atom, if it moves, suddenly the picture will become very blurry. So 
So up to now, neutron interferometry has not been incredibly useful because these things shake a little bit, and then you cannot see anything. So if you go and talk to these neutrons, and you say, I want to talk to you only if you've seen the blue box, but you don't couple to the vibration mode. What kind of behavior do you need? The quantum algorithm tells us. And suddenly so you change the path of where they go so that it is robust to this vibration. You can go and do this. And what we found is that the figure of merit, the kind of how much more precisely we can see the image, is about 600. So my colleagues would have killed for factors of three and four. So only we have factors of 600 coming up. So this is one of many technologies that are on the way and developing. So as we speak about technologies being developed, let's fast forward to 2016. And when we invite you back on stage for TEDx Waterloo 2016, what are you going to be showing us then? So I'll, again, pick only one of the many things I'll show you in 2016. So there's a way I mentioned about talking and listening to atoms. So photons, particles of light, again, that we've heard from Allison, knows when somebody tries to observe them. That's one of the properties of quantum mechanics. And this idea is that if you try to observe or detect a photon, you cannot do it without perturbing it, can be turned into a way to learn if an eavesdropper is trying to look at you. So you can use photons, you can take photons, you entangle them, send them to the telescope, send them to two people, we'll call them Alice and Bob, and then they can establish a key between them to do cryptography, to encode information, and they can find out if there's an eavesdropper in the middle. So this is something we cannot do in the world of Newton. So with quantum mechanics, we can find suddenly if there's an eavesdropper, and the implication of this for the internet information security is absolutely tremendous. But the problem with the device that we had before is that you need to have a line of sight. There are trees growing, it doesn't help. Oh, maybe we can use optic fibers. They can go around and make curves and then go to different cities. But if you take a photon and you send it through an optic fiber, you cannot go further than about 100 kilometer. The fiber absorbs the photon. So we were stuck with something which could go maybe a city, but not much further than this. So we've been working with the Canadian Space Agency, ComDev on the other side of 401, and the Institut National d'Optique in Quebec City to try to see if we can maybe do something with satellites. So we have a project and using what is called a LEO satellite, low Earth or orbit. They're called nano satellite, but not na nano in my world. They weigh about 75 kilo uh, kilograms. They are about 800 kilometers in the sky and they go about eight kilometers per second around. And what we want is to be able to exchange a key between a ground station and the satellite that goes around. And as the satellite goes around the Earth, it can establish a key between the satellite and a different city. And then you can use a trick to have the two city being uh, encoded with each other. So in 2016, I'll give you some data that comes out of this. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. We'll see you in three years.